Well, I want to uh, say first of all, I've really been excited about uh, being able to come out here and uh, very pleased that uh, Jungians are, are uh, able to have some involvement in real world issues. So uh, a couple of things to uh, preface my talk. Uh, you may have noticed that I, I got my doctorate in insect pathology uh, and now I'm a Jungian analyst. Uh, so many people have asked me about how that happened. I finally came up with a one sentence reply by being in Berkeley in the late 60s. <laughs> so uh, I consider myself to be a veteran of Berkeley of that time and uh, I'll just say I didn't miss much and I'll leave it to <laughs> I'll leave it to your imagination and it's probably all true. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, Pink Floyd was one of my favorite uh, groups in the 60s. I especially liked his Uma Guma album. And uh, one of the songs was Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun. Uh, so I decided to do that with regard to Jungian psychology. So in the next 23 minutes, I'm going to give the Jungian version of Baird Caldecott's very condensed presentation the other day. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to have to stick a little more closely to form than I uh, usually would like to. So I'm going to have to nail all my segues uh, to be able to do that. Uh, so if you all uh, uh, apologize, uh, uh, I apologize in advance for following uh, a, a text. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, 23 minutes long, and I'm going to try to, with story and dreams, reduce uh, Jungian psychology and eco-psychology to a single image. So uh, here it goes. Um, I'd like to start first of all by picking up on Galen McGowan's uh, fascinating focus on the dream by mentioning a dream that I had that helped place my soul and set me in a different professional direction. Uh, this was a dream I had, one of many powerful dreams in my last year at the Jung Institute in Zurich. And it was a single image dream, uh, one of the simplest dreams I've ever had and yet it was one of the most powerful dreams. It was a dream of a typical Midwestern uh, meadow or pasture scene. Uh, one that I would associate very much with something in Wisconsin where I grew up on a small dairy farm. There was a gent it was a gently rolling topography with some trees on the hillside. Uh, it was, uh, there was grass or alfalfa in the meadow. Of course, there had to be some insects flying above the field. Uh, it was a beautiful summer day, a uh, perfectly blue sky with some puffy white clouds. And that was a dream. You know, no fantastic California mountain and ocean scenery or Swiss Alps scenery, just a typical Midwestern pasture or meadow. But what was so incredible about that dream is that every single atom and molecule in that dream glowed with an inner light. It was what Jung called a numinous dream, a dream of a sacred landscape. And here was a sacred landscape that could have been nature, but it also could have been a farm field. And I maintain that the psyche cannot produce a more sacred image of the landscape. This is a good, as good as it gets, as the Miller beer commercial used to say. So my challenge then with this dream is the same challenge that I think any indigenous person would have with such a dream, is how in the waking state to be conscious of, one, of what one experienced in the dream. So how does one go about, do, uh, go about doing that? And I applied what I consider to be a typical Jungian way of approaching it. So first of all, I looked at every element in that dream as if it were a dream, of course, and then I brought what Hillman uh, calls an imaginative heart to every element. So to bring an imagination and a feeling for the grasses in the field, for the insects flying above it, for the topography uh, and the trees and that sort of thing. And then I looked at the various uh, mythological motifs the uh, religious uh, practices, uh, the stories and the poetry about the uh, landscape uh, and the environment up of the upper Midwest and about the individual elements in our upper Midwestern landscape. The idea is when one has such a dream is not just to go tell somebody about and say, oh, I had this great dream, 
but like with an indigenous person. I think of it like, you, like a, a powerful magnet and you let your consciousness be like the iron filings. You let that dream fascinate your consciousness and thereby restructure and reorient it. What one has to do as well when you have such a dream, and this is how you can use dreams to connect you to the land. You visit that landscape. You sit in it. I sat for three hours in that type of a landscape, just sitting there. And things were happening all the time. I, I noticed which, what in, insects would come up. I noticed the smells. I noticed how the, the clouds uh, formed from the evaporation on the land during the day, and so on. You, you take a synesthetic approach. All the senses have to work together. You know, just like Andrew back there sitting in the sun and rolling his head in the sun. You just kind of soak it all in. And your dream will help set you in an environment where your soul can be placed. The soul has to find a particular place, has to be grounded for it to be embodied and manifest. Another thing that you do with a dream is you have to do, make some creative pro, uh, project out of it. Uh, I made a video called Seasons of the Soul because one aspect of that video was the weather. And I've always been fascinated by clouds. So in this 15-minute student video, I looked at the psychological and the spiritual and the mythological dimensions of weather and seasons in the upper Midwest. Another thing that uh, I, I've done uh, is to employ dynamic systems theory, uh, particularly the concept of the situated robot uh, to an environment. Now, I, thanks to help, the help of people like Terence Deacon and George Hoganson, have, have reformulated the way I think about archetypes in terms of dynamic systems theory. And the idea with that, simply stated, is that uh, if you fully and, and, and are, if you are fully and sensually embodied in nature, the psyche, immersed and informed by the symbolic realm, will produce archetypal imagery and archetypal stories called myths. The successful myths, according to dynamic systems theory, are those that are best suited to the structure and functioning of the brain, to human interactions, and for our interest in this group, to the human relationship with the environment. And there's an evolutionary process that can take place with mythology. Myths are put out there, they evolve, those that work for the survival of the species in relationship to the environment are the successful myths. Now other ways that one can manifest um, a big a dream like this is through artwork and poetry. Certainly words are important, but these other ways are just as viable. Uh, dance, uh, song and so on. The uh, dream, this meadow dream, inspired me to set up a week-long conference in 1991, and uh, then again we did it in 1992, my wife and I, called Spirit in the Land, Spirit in Animals, Spirit in People. And what we did is we, I took a, I took science, Uranian psychology, and Native American spirituality from people in the Madison area and uh, chose a particular site that was typical of uh, Wisconsin in the upper Midwest and had these people all deeply in love with the land uh, to speak about it from many different perspectives. We had uh, Paul Soglin, uh, the mayor of Madison, we have, had Gesha Sopa, we had somebody doing uh, uh, a spirit animal uh, uh, things and the idea was to, to bring these things together in a didactic and an experiential manner. And the five talks that I gave at uh, those two conferences became the genesis of a book that I'm finally finishing after all these years that I'm calling The Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> uh, Jung, Hermes, Eco-Psychology, and Post-9-11. And the chapters include an archetypal view of the Midwest environment, Seasons of the Soul that I mentioned before, and of course, uh, for an entomologist, a chapter called Planet of the Insects, where I examine the most successful multicellular form of life on the planet, the insects. And I do that in a Jungian and scientific manner. So the experiences then with the Spirit in the Land conferences uh, prompted me to develop an area that I call a Jungian eco-psychology. 
Now, psychology was late in becoming involved with environmental issues for two main reasons. One is that psychology has focused largely on the individual, and two is it has focused on human-to-human -human interactions, pretending that the environment is not there. Thank God for what I, what I call St. James Hillman, a professional Jungian gadfly, who has tried to take psychology out of the consulting room into the world by, re, by resurrecting the Neoplatonic idea of Aphrodite as the soul of the world. So the world is beautiful and impacts you. It's not just what you're projecting onto the world. Eco-psychology then can be described as the psychology that studies our dysfunctional relationship with the environment in terms of our perceptions, attitudes, and behaviors, and how these may be changed to facilitate a sustainable relationship to the environment, as well as how psychology can be used to help connect us to the land. For if we're connected to the land, we do things out of love and appreciation for the land, and not, uh, not out of uh, laws and directives. I like to call eco-psychology the psychology of ecology and the ecology of psychology. For indeed, psychology can be improved by developing a more holistic ecological model of the psyche and one that includes a spiritual or trans a personal uh, dimension. For Carl Sagan believed that unless we can develop a sacred sense of the environment, the ball game is going to be over. He thought that was the only way that we are going to be able to muster the forces strong enough to oppose those that are destroying our environment. Now I think Jungian psychology can make an important contribution to eco-psychology and developing a sacred sense about nature. I see Carl Jung as being the prototypical eco-psychologist. I didn't discover him until I was uh, beginning to write my PhD thesis on factors influencing the susceptibility of the beet army worm Spidoptera exigua hubner to a nuclear polyhedrosis virus. Stop it, was a best <laughs> <laughs> it didn't become a bestseller. <laughs> so I was working on microbial control of insects, and I wasn't trying to cure the poor buggers, it was to use naturally occurring uh, organisms instead of chemical pesticides. For the uh, environmental revolution began with entomology. Now it's gone over to global warming, but it began with Rachel Carson and entomology. I was overwhelmed by Jung's ideas and felt I'd been looking for that since I'd read Walden, uh, Thoreau's Walden in the seventh grade. As a scientist, I was particularly impressed that Jung had developed, developed his concepts and the practice, his ideas of practicing, as an analyst out of his life experience, especially out of his connection with nature. Jung never lost that deep sense of nature as being the best presentation of what he called God's world. As an adult, Jung spent extended periods of time at a retreat that he designed and largely built by himself on the lower lake uh, Zurich called Bollingen. After arriving at Bollingen, he would spend two or three days just looking at the water or chopping wood. He loved to cook uh, to clear himself of his psychiatrist persona and sink into what he called the age-old son of the mother, otherwise called the two-million-year-old man within. He wanted to live out of that realm. His favorite illustration of what that realm was like was an anthropological report about the Nascapi Indians in the Labrador Peninsula in Canada. And these are Indians that wander about in fall, uh, small family bands in the forest. They don't have any organized social structure, no organized religious practices. They get their guidance by listening to the great man within. And Mr. Pio guides them by uh, sending them inner voices and by dreams. If they listen to the dreams and act on the dreams, Mr. Peel sends them more dreams. And these dreams guide them in their personal lives, tell them about changing weather patterns and about animal migrations. Now Jung believed that humankind's greatest challenge 
was to integrate our, cult, our uh, cultured, uh, scientific side with the two million year old man within. He believed that we get lost in our over-rational and our over-scientific minds. We lose connection with our fundamental nature that is, an in, that is an intimate part of nature by losing the main mode of communication with that realm, myths and symbols. The deepest critique then that one can make of a culture is an analysis of the dominant religion of that culture, remembering that myths are hummingbirds in motion. <laughs> that remembering that myths are other people's religions. Myths are other people's religions, not my religion. My religion is true, okay? So Jung analyzed the, the Judeo-Christian myth in a book he published in 1952 when he was 77 years old called Answer to Job. He believed the basic problem with Christianity is that Christianity is not a monotheistic religion. It's a dualistic religion. God is of equal, uh, God is of equal importance. There's a Freudian, Jungian slip. <laughs> the devil is of equal importance to God. The problem we have, as Jung saw it, the main problem in our Western culture is we do not have a whole image of the divine. The split in the God image runs like a fractal through every individual in our culture and permeates our political, economic, and social systems. Now Jung saw the 6th century BC story, and here's our, our Western myth. He saw the story of Job as being the turning point in our Western collective unconscious. The story is about Satan in an angel in heaven with God, planting a seed of doubt in God's mind about the faithfulness of the very successful and very pious Job. So God allowed Satan to punish Job to the point of death. That was his only limitation. Satan, um, uh, God, uh, well, Job. <laughs> I knew I'd get it right eventually. I only had three choices. Job confronted God and rightfully accused him of, mal of this malfeasance, expecting, if you will, an advocate of God against God. God had no answer to Job. He put on a tremendous display of power and of his majesty. That was all he could do. So Jung said that Job had seen the dark side of God. God was unconscious of his split-off side called the devil and was projecting the evil onto human beings. Job had demonstrated a modicum of consciousness greater than God's. So God then had to incarnate in human form to raise his consciousness and to atone for the injustice done to Job. He needs humans to fully enter three-dimensional reality and become objectively real. So Jung saw consciousness as humans' greatest gift, but it is vulnerable to being overwhelmed by the unconscious that presents itself in its most powerful forms in what we call gods and goddesses. Humans are the conscious part of creation, and we give it objective ob existence. Jung said, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by, bringing, by, but by making the darkness conscious. Now significant in this story is the fact that God did not seem to remember his feminine side until the story of Job came into existence. Stories of Sophia also began to appear around the 6th century BC. And they were stories about God's playmate, who had existed before the world was created. And she, like hexagram two in the I Ching, in comparison to hexagram one, helped manifest God's thoughts by bringing them into concrete existence. She brought a reflective side to God and the possibility of wholeness to counter God's insistent perfectionism, which Jung associated with the masculine, plus a friendliness and a compassion toward human beings. So God incarnated himself by impregnating a pure virgin and saw himself from the human side at the moment of the crucifixion. Jung saw this was not a full incarnation, 
because he was not in sinful man and the devil was not dealt with. In fact, St. Luke said that Satan was cast out of heaven, read God's dissociation, and has assumed a power on earth, according to Flip Wilson, probably greater than God's. Remember Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. So Jesus then became associated with the all light and the all love. But God's dark side broke through in St. John's revelations, an apocalyptic story of a vengeful, wrathful Christ in the form of a bloody ram. God himself destroys the world to save it. This is our Christian story about the environment. It wasn't the devil. We had to destroy the world to save it just like we tried to do in Vietnam, the ultimate biocide. A too perfect New, near New Jerusalem was created at the end of time, but Jung noted that only 144,000 virgins were going to be saved. In other words, no sex and no women. Also, the horror of Babylon was destroyed, representing an archetypal rejection of the feminine, the body, and sexuality. For the sacred horror was the earthly embodiment of the great goddess. An enlightenment was reached through intercourse with the sacred prostitutes who served the goddess by cultivating love-making abilities. In other words, by making love with a prostitute, you could enter an enlightened and prophetic state. A hopeful moment occurred in Revelations when a woman in a very pagan context started to descend from heaven with a male child in her arms. God had to withdraw her into hiding when a dragon confronted them. Jung saw this as the cultural unconscious not being ready for a new birth of consciousness. This was postponed indefinitely. He also saw the birth of Christ as being synchronous with the beginning of the age of Pisces, a 2,000 year old period. The first thousand years, the, the fish was bringing out God's light side. But after the, the second thousand years began, the darker side of God began to emerge. Jung coined the terms Age of Aquarius and New Age to signify a necessary evolution in our Western cultural unconscious. He felt that the Christian myth was dead and had no answer to the question of evil in the world. And to, to Jung, evil included human overpopulation of the planet, the continuing destruction of indigenous populations, and the atomic bomb. Now Christ said he would send a paraclete, the Holy Ghost, to continue the incarnation of God so everybody could become like gods. The church, however, soon put the kibosh on this process because the many visions that people were having often conflicted with the, evol the developing doctrinal and soon to be dogmatic positions. Heretics were persecuted and creativity at this mythic level in the Western collective unconscious was stifled. It was the alchemists who then secretly evolved the Christian myth by projecting a post-Christian collective unconscious into their vessels and retorts. They looked for the spirit in matter, not in the heavens, engaging matter with careful observations, imaginations, and visions. Their goal was to save the macrocosm and return it to a sacred dimension. The feminine was held to be sacred by them, and symbolically they were trying to unite the sacred feminine with the sacred masculine to produce a holistic image of God. Now Jung recognized alchemy as being the best historic and symbolic description of the shamanic journey he took into the unconscious after the split with Freud. The processes and symbolism of alchemy became the basis of his psychology, including active imagination and seeking the spirit in the unconscious, in matter, and in nature. Now Mercurius was the god of the alchemist, known as Hermes in Greek mythology. He's also the god of psychology, the god of businessmen, the god of advertising people, um, and certainly the god of Jung, and also the British psychoanalyst D.W. Winnicott. Winnicott was obviously under the archetype of Hermes. I propose that Hermes is also the god of dynamic systems theory and the god of eco-psychology. So why is it important to talk about gods and goddesses? 
The ancient Greeks knew that the gods and goddesses weren't literally real, but the collective effects that everybody in the culture felt were real. So, the gestalt of those effects that everybody experienced were encapsulated and brought into the focus of consciousness by telling myths and stories about gods and goddesses, by song and dance and music, and portraying their images. The gods and goddesses, or the, the ideas of them, were also developed by the particular type and location of their temples, their sacred groves, and the animals, and the smells, and the insects that were associated with them when they were worshipped, etc. Each god and goddess represented a total gestalt, a complete worldview that helped <coughs> bring into consciousness their worldview by worshipping them. So when the Greeks would fall ill, they used to go to the sacred healing sites like Apodorus, and they would, there would be dream incubation temples. They would hope to have a dream that the priest would interpret, and the main thing the priest was looking for was to tell that person what god or goddess they had to worship in order to be healed. In other words, you had lost connection with the whole by ignoring some archetypal dynamic known as gods or goddesses. And by worshiping them, you could become whole again. One is fully human only when, fully human and well, only when one has a story that fits one into the whole, including nature. So Hermes was the only son of a nymph to make it into the Olympic pantheon. He did it by trickery and boldness and to honor his mother, a follower of Nemesine. Now, Nemesine was the goddess associated with mythic oral tradition uh, and verbal memory, and she was the mother of the muses. Hermes, a bastard son of Zeus, stole Apollo's cattle as a day-old child, incurring Apollo's wrath. Apollo tried to kill Hermes, was unsuccessful. Zeus commanded the two of them to be friends. Hermes took the initiative by music, by playing Apollo a song on the lyre that he had invented, totally enchanting in Apollo. Apollo then, uh, Hermes then gave Apollo the lyre, and Apollo gave Hermes domain over the domestic and wild animals and the bee oracle. As an entomologist, I was fascinated by the fact that Hermes had a bee oracle. And I think that's linked to the ecstatic prophetic states of the sacred prostitutes. The Athenians worshipped Hermes in the form of a phallus on a uh, quadratic base with a smiling head on top of it. And this is symbolic of uh, bringing consciousness to the deepest levels of the psyche. Hermes is the god associated with bringing consciousness to an embodied state, with physicality, sensuality, sexuality, and imagination, and bringing a voice to the mute world of the animals. Apollo's world became that of science, with reasoned approach, purity, and disciplined form. Hermes was like the shaman of the tribe, who knew all the myths of the gods because he was the genesis of those myths. Therefore, he was a messenger and diplomat uh, between the gods, but also between the gods and human beings, the god of communication and the god of the unconscious. He represented the link back to the feminine, the body, nature, myth, and verbal memory at a time in our Western tradition when the Greek culture was developing a more masculine approach in writing, mathematics, history, and philosophy. The essence of Hermes can be reduced to a single image, that of his wand. The wand is a figure eight with a gap in the top, and um, I like to think of the wand as an evolution. Out of an original wholeness, some direction develops. At the same time, a counter direction develops uh, in the unconscious. Both of them then develop their full potentialities, and then they come together and not join, but interact. And the, the secret is in the interaction in this space. The closer and the more powerful the interaction, the greater is the creative process that occurs. 
psyche can, and soul can be imagined as emerging out of this interaction. And the most powerful interaction was the, Jung, the one that Jung had. It was his interaction with the God image that he felt within. Any deep question he had, he took to God and said, what's happening here? Why is this happening? And he wrote answer to Job as a personal, emotional response to the story of Job. He said that's the only way the gods can be incarnated. These are those powerful forces in our lives by engaging them. This brings them into existence and, and we both uh, are increased by the process. So the gap in the wand is the boundary. Hermes is the god of the boundaries. And it's also about journeying. It's how well one journeys in life. Hermes is the god of the journey. I see it as a transitional space in Winnicott, the liminal space in the initiation ceremonies, and the bifurcation points with high dimensionality in dynamic systems theory. Now that sounds like a bunch of jargon, I'll just let it go at that. Either side being defensive, denigrating the other side, or labeling them as the enemy or evil destroys this creative interactive process. Significant movements out of the wholeness include the rise of the archetypal masculine leading to a patriarchal society, humans attempting to manipulate and control nature, and an emphasis on the, the rational and the enlightened perspective. Combining this model with being able to diplomatically reach across all levels and to all positions, I think you can see why I propose Hermes as the god of eco-psychology and his wand as a guiding image for this conference. Thank you. I don't know how many minutes that came out to be? 30. 30? 30. Was it? Oh. That's right. <laughs> and a trickster. <laughs> well, um, I think what we we're, we're sort of playing with the schedule, and, um, and John has uh, asked John if it's possible to move lunch. We're actually having lunch here, as it turns out. Move lunch back a half hour. I hope you didn't mind that I uh, decided for your digestive systems to do that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I thought we might take 20 minutes now, 15 to 20 minutes now, and kind of digest this a little bit. It's a lot of material, and, um, to, and David's uh, talk is right on the horizon. And I would get, I, I just would feel indigestion, and I wouldn't be able to eat lunch. I think if I had that much material without a little bit of feeling like we had uh, discussed some of these thoughts and ideas. So let's take about uh, you know till you know 15 to 20 minutes and open this up. And uh, I'm sure there's some brooding ideas or thoughts or concerns? I just wanted to say uh, your idea of the space between two points of view and that that allows uh, some creative process to occur I think is a nice image for all of us to hold whenever we're standing across from another trying to understand their position or trying to uh, un and then trying to understand our position, that that space in between can actually be uh, a part of the, the creative process. I mean, that's a, that's a nice mm -hmm. image. And to bring that to, just thinking of uh, like dialoguing, uh, somebody mentioned the dialoguing with, uh, I think Mitch, with the evangelicals. I mean, the way I think of Hermes about that, uh, in, in that regard, is that Hermes is about that most basic, basic mythic level. So when you're talking with somebody with these powerful religious convictions, you have to, to think of, of what fundamental religious belief pattern that person is coming out of. Uh, you have to have some understanding or feeling for that to be able to dialogue well and then meet them at that, at that gap. sort of a question for uh, all of the Jungian uh, psychologists, uh, not just Dennis, but Dennis in particular might take the lead on answering. Uh, there's, a, there's a book called The Greek Myths of Robert uh, Graves. Mm -hmm. um, and in the introduction to that book, um, Graves sets out 
uh, a contrast with his own approach to myth, specifically with Carl of Jung. Uh, and he says myths are not the sort of thing, and perhaps he's sort of reducing uh, uh, Jung in a kind of caricature here that arise from the uh, collective unconscious, but they are an oral culture's way of symbolically <coughs> remembering its past. Uh, and so he finds, in, in, interestingly, uh, a kind of uh, the, that 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 the the Greeks were originally a people from the uh, uh, Caucasus who swept down in a series of invasions into the Mediterranean world, worshiping a, a male sky god, uh, and there were an overwhelming uh, an indigenous population uh, which uh, worshipped the uh, great uh, goddess. And that that he sees in all of these myths this conflict between the historical conflict between these invaders with their masculine principle and uh, sort of they represent their history as as the victory of the uh, male over the female mm -hmm. uh, and he tries to uh, analyze uh, all of these myths essentially. Uh, in a historical uh, context, uh, and so I'm just wondering if, if uh, how the unions respond to uh, uh, Graves' alternative uh, interpretation of uh, the, uh, the the origin and the the, the essence, really, of uh, ancient Greek mythology. I. Uh well, personally, I don't see any problem at all with that. Uh, well, some problems, <laughs> but uh, basically, sure, you have your 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 uh, cultures with their myths, and then if some new culture comes and uh, superimposes, tries to superimpose some other myths, with the understanding that, particularly in those times, myths were the things that gave people their sense of meaning and cultural identity. And so that, to Jung, is simply what myths do, and that's what the archetypes do for everybody in that culture. So uh, wh where I did have some problem with Graves, though, I thought he was trying to uh, reduce everything back to some, some what had been done to the, kind of the, 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 the earth goddess type myths of that right. time. And that's why I think Hermes is, is such a crucial god to focus on when we look back at the, the origin of our kind of uh, sort of at our mythic base because I see Hermes as that attempt in in Greek society which was going off in this more shall we say archetypal masculine or yang uh, dimension that uh, when Zeus commanded Hermes and Apollo to be together I saw that as a challenge in our Western culture to think very much in terms of the Chinese yin and yang symbol is that uh, when he commanded those two to be together, it's like that, that science and the masculine was always to be in a loving, appreciative gap relationship with the feminine, with verbal memory, with the body, with being embodied, with sensuality, sexuality, and so on. And uh, by focusing on that God, like I say, the, the Greek uh, incubation temples, you would try to find out what God you were missing in your psyche. And I, I think in our Western psyche, if we, can fo we, if we focus or bring some focus to that, and, and especially for men, one of the reasons I like to focus on Hermes is that there's been a lot of talk about the goddess as a way of reconnecting with the earth. But I think men need a image of sacred sexuality and I summarize the basic problem with Christianity as being, can you imagine Jesus with an erection? You know? But, uh, uh, so there are, uh, yeah, Graves, I thought, in a way, was a little too reductionist. And uh, I, I, th I thought that Jung's, uh, I, I thinking more in terms of dynamic systems theory, if a culture is to survive, its myths have to evolve as well. And, uh, 
And that's why we have to have death. If, if angels represent a particular worldview, if you will, then humans with their worldview have to die off so then, then new mythic stories can emerge. I think the, the, the question that you asked that is almost for me at the heart of what the two languages have been here throughout the two days. Whether we call it the language of science on one hand, or the language of politics, or the language of business, we have these three so far, and then the language of the soul, the language of psyche. And I think we've been having a real devil of a time trying to listen to each other. And I have to say, I sympathize with the people who speak the language of science and the language of philosophy, and the, well, not philosophy, the language, because I see them more with psychology or somewhere in between. I see Andrew shaking his head, so maybe I should put them over there. I don't know. <laughs> but I sympathize with them because I think the translation that you have to make is much more difficult than the one we have to make. So, that said, you've brought in another thing about Graves and Jung. And I think there are 180 degrees about myth. I think Graves makes myths a matter of history. It's about the way we remember the past. And I think Jung's notion of myth is completely opposite of that. It's not that we are remembering anything, it's that we are being remembered. We don't make the myths, the myths make us. They are living realities. And in that sense, they do come from something deeper than the ego, rational mind. They well up from the collective psyche. And right now, we happen to be in the myth of science. And what makes it difficult is that living within that myth, which tells a certain story about how it eclipses the medieval religious sensibility to give us the rise of science. When you're in a myth, you're like a fish in water. The fish would be the last one to discover what water is. But I think the pond is drying up, if I can follow the metaphor, and suddenly fish are beginning to wonder, is there another story here? And I think that's not something we make, but something that is making us. And I think we're on the edge of that. I would like to say something in behalf of science, uh, given that uh, I have a science background. After the end of my first year in Zurich, uh, I had a dream I thought that indicated that my science side was suffering. Uh, it seemed there was so much emphasis on the rational, the feminine, the intuitive myth in Zurich. Uh, I was just beginning to, to sense that there was some, that I was being looked down upon a bit as a scientist and a fellow scientific friend of mine had the same experience. So I had a dream of a uh, of a, the one-room country school I went to in Wisconsin and beneath the softball playing field, and that was the only sport we played, and we played it in the snow and we didn't have a basketball or football, everything was softball. And that was the only time with a school of 28 kids I was ever the star. I was, I was, I was center field, like uh, Fogarty said. Uh, so I, that was, to me was the epitome of game, sport, and playing. So beneath that playing field and all those association, elemental playing, was a huge cavern full of white rabbits. And at one end of that cavern was a, my archetypal German scientist, who to me was the best, uh, uh, epit he was the epitome of scientific thought that I, that I got at Berkeley, was working with some test tubes. So simply translated, there was a lot of unconscious scientific creativity that I was in an elemental form that I was experiencing at that time. And to me, it's like Apollo can be friends with Hermes. Science has its domain. What happened in that myth with Hermes and Apollo's cattle was a separation, a delineation. You have to delineate what the two realms are and then you honor that. And as long as you can say, well, this is science, okay, we're gonna stick to what we can measure and, 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 and experiment with, but the ultimate story about what science leaves out was a Wisconsin scientist named Harry Harlow. He worked with monkeys and love, <laughs> and Harry Harlow had to prove to the academic community that love was important for human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, if that doesn't say something about the limits of science, what every loving mo mother and father knows without going to university, please tell me what it is. No, it, I don't know if you're saying this, but I, in saying science is a myth does not denigrate it. And I'll give you one quick story. I had a pituitary tumor seven years ago, which caused me to lose sight on one side of my left eye. And I had to make a quick decision. So to make a long story short, I chose a guy in Los Angeles who was going to do the surgery. And as I was preparing for the surgery, 
a friend of mine who was a physician sent me a painting of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, where God is reaching down, mm -hmm. man is reaching up. Yeah. And he's a physician and also um, a depth psychologist. And he said, look at that little place where in God's hand there is tucked a little angel, a putti. He said, he's actually mapping the brain. And that little putti is where the, uh, the gland, what the, the pituitary gland sits in your head. So I got all excited and I went to the physician and I said to him, I thought about doing this, my wife talked me out of it. I said, I want to, you know, I, I want you to know about this disconnection between science and art. And then I realized when my wife talked to me, you know, the thing is, I wanted this guy to be as technically expert as possible. I did not want him thinking about Michelangelo's painting <laughs> when he was taking 12 hours to go up my nostril to, to get out that tumor. So I'm agreeing with that. That is really important that science has its place. But it is also has a mythic unconscious foundation to it. And when it leaves out too much, that's when we get into trouble. It's like the, all the fairy tales, I call fairy tales the, the, the layperson's alchemy, uh, are about what is left out. It's that thing that is left out that comes back to haunt you. And in our society, because of the dominate, dominance of science and the Apollonic worldview, uh, there's been a lot left out. A lot of juicy, you know, earthy stuff. A lot of stuff about our bodies and nature. And one of the problems I ran into uh, was I started off with this love of nature, you know, hiking the woods with my dog and everything, collecting all these bugs. And uh, then the further and further I got in science, you know, I became a specialist on this nuclear polyhedrosis virus. And I couldn't walk in nature anymore without thinking about some kind of experiment I could set up. And I knew I'd lost something. But when I got to Zurich, the dollar, the value of the dollar went down 48% in nine months. I had to get a job. <laughs> So two jobs came up teaching biology in Swiss private schools. And that got me back into a more basic level of science, uh, which combined with being at the Jung Institute, really made me feel what it was to be whole again. But it was with the help of dreams. Um, one of the things that I, I want to quickly bring back that I sensed in Galen's talk, that um, because there's a tremendous tension in language, I think, from previous discussions to this discussion, and a real shift to language that uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, it, well, it's just different. <laughs> uh, I, I particularly was moved by bringing back images of gluttony and um, evil. I was just, I think I was, after the talk, after listening last night and feeling that 10-year expanse that we might have to think about living in and, uh, and a lot of the other images, and then talking about George Bush, um, that I was just aware we don't use that language, and that language has a powerful effect socially, politically. Um, I mean, it's, it, it has been religious language, but it also sounds like language that's very precise in a way that we no longer name that which um, is in fact the thing that we are trying to speak to. Um, we've talked a lot about changing people uh, to get them to you know, sort of adhere to more environmentally responsible values. But I don't know that we can do that without recognizing that we're also speaking to uh, that which is that which is the habits that there, we are all doing, which I think is what I heard in Galen's, that we have these habits, we all do. We have these habits of driving cars and um, eating fast food and participating in the burning up of the, of the uh, planet. But we don't talk about that. We don't, talk, we don't call that anything in ourselves. I thought that just could open up a really interesting um, mm -hmm. dialogue about about just naming things that we don't name like that. Well, and maybe just throw that I don't know, back to you if that was at all how you would uh, intended those images and pictures to come up as uh, something that we could begin to use again as language. That's a common language that you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think that because those words are so much a part of our unconscious, and when you do hear them, you are affected by them, they are tools that we could use to reframe a lot of the things that we discuss in the environment. And, and when I was thinking about this uh, a night or two ago, 
as we have been talking about the Republican agenda and how effective they've been with using language to frame certain agendas and how the Democratic Party does not seem to be able to do that or hasn't done that as well, it made me think about some of these uh, deeper words that are associated with images that are in our unconscious and could we resurrect them in a way that allowed us to apply them to the environmental movement, the Democratic Party, in a, in a way that captures the unconscious because it's really the unconscious that is so effective from affected by what the Republican Party has been able to do with language. So exactly what those words are and how they're put together, you know, I don't really know, but I, but I, I know things like uh, that we're struggling with an idea of unity, as we were talking about with the Democratic Party, and what types of powerful wor words from the unconscious and images can we use to create even a feeling sense of unity um, within a Democratic Party. One of the words that I most <coughs> find uncomfortable with the Democratic Party is the word that it's tolerant of diversity, for example. and. I don't really want to tolerate anything, particularly. I would rather be embracing it, supporting it, and advancing it rather than tolerating it. And so I don't think that that word alone particularly creates an unconscious momentum towards doing anything active that one can be proud of. And so I think, yes, exactly, those words behind what, the images. One of the, one of the ways I, I was having a conversation with Brooke on the walk yesterday, and we were talking about, um, you know, that there was a little bit of a conversation about how, it, how ecology had, was a family value now. You know, that was a family value. And I was wondering, wouldn't it be interesting to make a commercial of having a, a, an ecological, a, a sound family going up the hill or a mountain or on vacation, and then make, have another commercial of a gluttonous family <laughs> who was throwing things out the window and, uh, you know, going to their home and the trash all around. That that that, that image of, a, of, of gluttony and um, these various um, evil qualities that, in fact, are embedded in the way that we're treating nature are not called anything, and we don't do that publicly. And I'm not sure the Republicans haven't, in some ways, done that. It was such an ad. Was it? <laughs> yeah, the, um, the uh, crying Indian. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw um, an ad yesterday um, on TV when I came, we got back to the room, and it was um, so just a bunch of kids going tick, 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 oh. and then, you know, at the end it said globalwarming.org or something. Mm -hmm. And it, Exactly. And I was trying to figure out why it didn't work. It's an ad. Because usually, you know, we were always talking about putting a clock, yeah. which always gives a sense of immediacy. But somehow, <coughs> seeing these kids saying tick, 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 for, for me, at least, as an ad, it did not work. And yet, I appreciated the image that they were doing. So, I guess what it is, is, is just a form of language, again, finding the right words. I was thinking of the historical context of those images that they really, it's the Renaissance time period, I believe, and this is, you know, what exploded in that time period was the use of image to convey ideas in a, in a completely novel way. And it just brought up within me, you know, what are the images that we now need, that we don't have, to convey the thing, messages that we need to convey. I think as a, oh. in addition to that would be the dominant voice that the public hear is through television and radio and the internet. And it seems that if even if we had an image, how would that image then be allowed to permeate given the opposition and the competition with the things that we now hear on television and radio and the internet. I'm not exactly following you, but I was so struck. Yesterday we talked uh, 
what could an image of global warming possibly be? And when I look at this picture um, of wrath and envy and jealousy at the side of the psyche, this seems like an image of global warming to me. Um, and I'm linking that to the idea of what would it mean for Orpheus and Eurydice to come back from, well, from the underworld, the return of, um, looking to your talk of the, you know, the feminine, from a place of having been disregarded for so long, that the initial eruption of these images would be of a global warming kind until, as their images in a sense of the return of the repressed. And so from a psychological level, what would it mean to, you know, begin to pay attention uh, to, to the return of these very, very powerful demonic um, and frightening images and how that's being acted out in nature itself. And then the other question I had was, um, you, you talked about Pisces and Christianity and the dark side, the second fish and the second millennium. And then you began to talk about Aquarius, and my, my question was, were you imagining that in recovering the demonic, the dark side, the divine, the, the last feminine, etc., and using um, Hermes as a kind of unifying image, was the, is that your image of the new age of Aquarius? Hmm. And yeah, Hermes... Uh I, I see Hermes uh, as the the image for the process. It's about the process. It, Hermes is not an image of what the goal is. Hermes is what, uh, if you will, helps produce the image or the song or the dance or the stories or or whatever that that help move us to something thinking ecologically more sustainable. And in terms of the images and the fear, then there's a wonderful book uh, about the Black Madonna. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a series of dreams uh, with a woman, woman and Jungian analysis and some of the images that come up uh, about the feminine and the earth are so powerful. It's about this, this woman for example, being chained underneath the city of Chicago, just isolated and down there by herself. And the, uh, the, uh, she was in Jungian analysis, and you can see how her images changed as, as she began to relate to her own quote-unquote feminine side and connect with the earth. But when, and it's one of the reasons people don't get into the unconscious, and it's one of the reasons we have trouble looking at the, the environmental problems is that when we, when we turn around and face what's really there, it is frightening and overwhelming, and that's enough to say, to hell with that, you know, I'm just gonna keep driving my S SUV as fast as I can the other direction. But, uh, but also, in, in a more general sense, in, uh, in working with women, especially women uh, that, say, grew up in the, in the 50s, uh, that you, you come to a point in the analysis where they're up against the, the cultural collective devaluation of the feminine. And that's where I think Jung's idea of the archetype is so important. Uh, there's not something personally wrong with you or that you did wrong. Your whole culture is devaluing you as a person because you're female. And that's something that's that is pretty devastating to face as well. But that's how it can come up in an individual person. And for the male, it's, well, how does the feminine come up in their psyches? And again, it can come up as a very witchy, scary figure. Gonna, uh, Susie, why don't you? Uh, I was kind of curious to hear perhaps a perspective from uh, outside of the scientific perspective or Side. Why don't we just take two more comments and then Dave, Dave just left, but he'll be back. And we'll, uh, Susie and, and, and the, the piece that I wanted to speak to is um, what you said earlier. Um, one is whole in a well human being when one has a story that fits one into the whole. I find that really intriguing in that there is sort of maybe an objective whole, one could be an objective well being. 
And then there's perceptual well-being, you know, how do I perceive myself? I mean, there's lots of images and stories that tell people right now that, you know, it, you're going to be whole if you buy this SUV, or you're going to be whole and well and whatever if you fit into this society. And those of us who don't actually experience quite a discomfort and a displacement within this very, what you know, we perceive as a dysfunctional, not a whole <laughs> society. So that the question for me is, whose responsibility is it to break the news to those um, you know who are not whole, and do we ha are we the ones to do that? And what you know presumptuousness is there in us saying you're not whole, you're not whole, but I'm whole, or you know <laughs> there's another whole that we all should be part of. I mean, there's something really hard about. I mean, and people don't necessarily are welcoming to hear the news that they're not whole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so who's, who's you know who's Prerogative is it to say that? Um, is that not completely arrogant? And who's going to break the bad <laughs> I like to think of it as, in some of the comments I made yesterday, of, 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 of trying to, to build a story literally from the ground up by putting the emphasis on the earth and our connection to it. And, and Hillman pointed out that just like in the human psyche, we didn't become aware of our unconscious until the pathological side started to show, and we're not becoming aware of the environment until the pathologies of the environment show. So enough people are aware that something is happening here, but like, like Bob Dylan said, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? So, uh, so I think part of it is, is by, by emphasizing the pathology and then telling the story which science has an important part here about uh, about how we are indeed part of nature and then that's where the people like make these cartoons of the coca-cola bears can come in and, and put some some nice images and, and and songs to it and rather than say you're not whole just say okay let's let's start from the ground up and uh, and uh, and approach it that way just want to make back to Aldo Leopold who you know had something very specific to that to say I mean he, he actually said you know it's very hard to be sort of the doctor who sees a community you know being ill mm -hmm. and has to break that news but it doesn't want to hear it so I mean you know mm -hmm. that that struggle of someone seeing something the rest doesn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> doesn't want to hear is, is around for a while and and I think we need to you know find ways to convey the dark side, the you know the other side of the paradox, the the thing that's unconscious, and I find that actually, in terms of making that practical, a practical task, really difficult. And the other yeah. thing that you just uh, no. I'm gonna play Zeus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Hal, so and then and Andrew, and then we're done. <laughs> I I just like to go back to your original dream and because um, I I didn't quite understand the analysis. Of, of your dream. And of, the, of the metal? Yeah, because to me, if I, if I had that dream, and I went to my therapist, as we always started in the morning, went mm -hmm. to dream, and I gave him that dream. First, so, first thing he would say is, because he knew all the symbols mm -hmm. that I had, he would say, okay, so you want to go back to your childhood because something is bothering you. Ah. You want to go back to that idyllic home that you so cherished. But you were in Freudian analysis, yeah, right? Yeah, that's, not, no, <laughs> that's, that's the, that's no, that's the that's answer. answer. There's, there's, yeah, there's no interpretation. No, no, no. Let me, <laughs> and then, so, so weird, then I'd say, yeah, you're right. And then my therapist would say, okay, what happened yesterday that made you, prompted you to have this regression dream? Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, and I would say, well, it was I read about global warming, or I had a, or I had a fight with my wife, or my kid didn't listen to me, uh -huh. but I just I the hell with it. I'm going mm -hmm. back. Is there any commonality between my Freudian interpretation and your Jungian interpretation? Yes, yes and no, but uh, I I uh, think yes the basic. How's that for a psychological? <laughs> The, that was one of the main differences between Freud and Jung, is, is Freud basically tried to reduce everything. I, I call it trying to run everything through a Procrustean bed. 
of, your, of the influences of the family of origin. And Jung said, yeah, there's a place for that in analysis, but the psyche can also produce uh, prospective dreams. It can produce numinous dreams that are really meant to fascinate you and put you in a new perspective. And this is what I was going to about to respond to you, is that it's not enough to tell people something is wrong or that they have some addiction. There has to be something equally powerful to replace it. And that's how Jung's ideas became the foundations of AA. But that's a profound difference between the Jungian and the Freudian approach, is that no, to, to reduce a dream like, like that would be to butcher it. You I see, kind of play Hera and let Dawn say something. Just one moment. I'd say actually there is a commonality for sure. Yeah. In that, yes. uh, as a, maybe just speaking for myself, but as a Jungian, I always look at every dream in context. It, things happen in context, and that's where their meaning is. They may dreams may add something new that we've never thought of, or new experiences that we've never had, but they happen in a context. And that's what your analyst was, what you were doing, what your analyst was doing. And it's the same thing. I don't think that's reductive. I think that's an appreciation that we live in, you know, we live with others who affect us. We live in an environment that affects us. We okay. So I, there's no... And Andrew, please bring I another context. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make a plea to... I was a bit worried about how we sort of set up today as a reflection on what I thought was a very healthy set of discussions and disagreements yesterday. Um, and, and I'm worried about the, the sort of the way it's been sort of, we started talking about it today, is making it sort of seem like people in the room or under the tent are too, too far away. You know, I don't think or, it's... Or too. Yeah, I don't think it's psychology and the unconscious on one side and science and politics on the other mm -hmm. at all. I think that Susie captured it Great. Some of us have been talking about civic renewal, right? And some of us are talking about a bunch of other very important topics involving the unconscious, involving the soul, involving the psyche. And I don't, I, I, I maintain, I think Susie's right, that we're not sure that they're not incompatible, but I want to make us, help us to, I, I think we need to think about how they can be made more compatible. And maybe one way of doing this is to stop, I don't think, I, I don't believe in philosophy, I don't believe in science. I don't believe in psychology. I believe there are psychologists and scientists and philosophers. And David and I, uh, just not to, to pick David as an example, but I know David, known him for a long time, and we came up from two very different traditions of philosophy, had two very different kinds of training, and so we bring two very different perspectives to some common set of environmental problems. The same is true for psychologists. I've worked with lots of scientists who certainly don't work in a reductionistic, you know, model where they think that they are, you know, have the dominant uh, discourse that's going to tell everyone what to do. And, and I think if we start thinking about how it is that we're all people, right, rather than representatives of a profession or an ethos or something like that, then we really do find a lot more ground where, I mean, just embodied in this room, a lot of people are you know, coming at this from many different perspectives. So, so I think if we sort of maybe sort of reset the day on that framework, then we might actually find a lot more integration, you know, than we might otherwise think there is.